Okay? This is the clue one in the decipher window problem. In that very same paper, I found this last The paper ends with this paragraph. <laughs> this is very interesting because as a person when he's trying to decipher, like he would have been pretty excited by because he's got so many clues already by just looking at these two inscriptions. So he's pretty excited and then he's got a fear and he expresses that in the last passage. Let's see what his fear is. It's a, he says, it, re it would require an accurate acquaintance with many of the learned languages of the East as well as a perfect leisure and abstraction from other pursuits to engage upon the recovery of this lost language language slash script okay. but when its simplicity of vocables is compared with the difficulties of Persepitolian or cuneiform character lately deciphered by Grotefriend and Saint Martin or the most obtruse helographics of the Egypt attempted by Young and Champollion it seems almost a stigma on the learned of our country that this should have remained an enigma for so long. So he's basically saying, by the way, when this was happening, the cuneiform script and the Egyptian hieroglyphics were, were already deciphered. So he's saying when such difficult things had been cracked, and in this one single paper I had already found so many clues, this should be a stigma that we are, we are still not able to decipher this guy. And then he says that, that the learned of our country that this should have remained so long an enigma to scholars and the object of the present notice is to invite fresh attention on this subject lest the indefatigable students of the Bonn or Berlin should run away with the honor of first making it known to the learned world. He's saying if we don't, if you guys don't get together and crack the script, the people in Berlin are going to crack this. Because they had already cracked, cracked the toughest scripts heliographics in the Hebrew form. So he's really concerned, he's, he's appealing to the readers of the journal saying guys now start focusing on this, we should crack this script. He's quite right because the paper does get lots of attention and in, in the next four years Brahmi is cracked by the British. Actually Princip cracks it to a great extent. The next clue comes in the, in the same year in October. March is when James writes this uh, paper. October, there's a person called B.H. Hodgson. Hodgson, how do you pronounce it? Anyways, so he was staying in Mumbai. Uh, sorry, he, he was a political resident in Nepal. He's got, by then, British had conquered some territories in Nepal as well. So he was put as a resident to, you know, the king would still be a namesake ruler, and uh, these guys would be uh, the, the ones who are making moves in the background. So he comes across a couple of pillars in Bihar. So these are called, in those days those places are called Mathaya and Radhya. Today we know them as Lauria Nandagad and Lauria Ara Raj. Okay? Uh, these are two villages. There are two Ashoka inscriptions again here. Pillar inscriptions. So he says, I found these inscriptions, I found these pillars, very similar to the Delhi character, uh, the Delhi pillar and the Allahabad pillar. He says, I've got this. He, uh, he is actually, he, he gets a copy of this, uh, no, 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 sorry, that's not, that's not right. So, uh, he compares this, he identifies two consonants. So, we know that it's an abugida type, it has got ovals, it has got consonants. Now, you need to know what symbol matches what oval and what consonant sound means what. So, he does crack two characters, two consonants on the Delhi Topra pillar. Uh, it's again just looking at the variation in stylistics. He guesses, he actually guesses uh, six, no, no, he actually guesses three characters. Uh, out of them, actually, two, only two are correct. Uh, uh, he actually deciphers three consonants, but out of them, actually, only two are correctly deciphered. Uh, and then during this time, on the very same article that he writes, Princip writes a note, which is, which is very interesting. He says, of the origin and nature of the singular columns erected at places so distant from each other this Delhi, Allahabad, Betraya and Patna uh, all bearing precisely the same inscription by the way, again this one also starts with Devanampi and Vyadas very same characters it's like uh, uh, all bearing precisely the same inscription as far as known, unknown characters is concerned I will not venture to offer any speculations 
whether they mark the conquest of some victorious raja, whether they are as it were the boundary pillars of a dominion, or whether they are of a religious nature, bearing the same important text from the sacred volumes of Buddhists or Brahmins, can only be satisfactorily solved by the discovery of the language. And consequently, the import of these curious monuments are intended to convey. The new facts now brought to light will, I hope, tend to facilitate the object especially the discovery of double characters which added to the mode of forming the words leaves little doubt that the alphabet a modification of Devanagari and the language Sanskrit. There are two important things in this. He obviously, he thought in the first paper that it was Sanskrit. It, it, it was not Sanskrit. Here he misses it. He thinks it's Sanskrit. Another thing that he says, whether they mark the boundaries of a Raja or was it spreading some important religious message? Actually, these are quite right. If you look at lots of Ashoka's major rock edicts, they lie across the borders of Ashoka's territory. So, I mean, again, fascinating to look at in retrospect. This guy knew nothing of the character, and he's able to guess what is the important significance of these monuments. I mean, it just stands out. Now. So. I mean, we are going through how this process of disappointment happened. There is not much of scientific nature to it, I feel, but a lot of intuition. So how the principle is just guessing these things so correctly, right? Third clue comes from an inscription in a cave called Karli. So if you travel from Pune to Mumbai, there is a place called Karli. Uh, fascinating place you guys should visit. Uh, it's got a, again a rock cut Buddhist uh, Chaitya Hall. Uh, Maharashtra has lots, lots of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist rocket uh, architecture. Um, there is an inscription there, there is another person called uh, Reverend J. Stevenson. Uh, he again compares with the later uh, period inscriptions and guesses 12 consonants. He actually guesses 30 consonants, actually out of them only 12 are correct. Uh, it's just by looking at the change in statistics, there is nothing scientific about it. Uh, but he tells an interesting story, he says, he actually procures this journal from a friend in which uh, the Princip had published the Allahabad inscription and written that important paper in 1834. So he says, I've got this document from my friend. I looked at these inscriptions, they're very similar, and I, let me really con contribute, it, contribute back to the society that I found something else, I've deciphered some consonants. So he writes, It's been about a year since I, f I first began to search among the learned natives of this place for a key to these inscriptions. But I was provokingly sent by the Marathas to the Canaries. Canaries meaning being the coastal, like the Andhra Polisar period place, uh, to the Canaries, and by them to the Tamilians, and so on, without any result in an endless succession. So basically, like Indians would say, okay, go here, those people will tell. Go to Varanasi, they will tell. So he's been, he's been made to move here and there. I then made a collection of all the alphabets used on the side of India, and made the attempt through means of them to decipher the inscription, but still with no encouraging success. While engaged in these attempts, happily, the mass number of your journal was sent to me by my friend. Okay, by a friend. And through the aid it offered to me in furnishing with uh, furnishing me with the alphabet of inscription number two, which is a Samutra Gupta inscription on Allahabad pillar, with some little assistance from the sources above mentioned, I've been able to decipher some of our inscription. And hope that if you have if you have not found the key to this character of the inscription one, which is Ashoka inscription, my alphabet may carry you several steps towards its attainment, and so repay the debt I owe for the assistance derived from this journal. So he gets his journal by accident, and that helps him eventually crack some consonants. Uh, clue four comes in the fifth volume of the Journal of Asian Society of Bengal. Now it's from Lumistomatics, the study of chords. What's happening during this period is lots of stupas of uh, Buddhist period, Ashokan period and late Ashoka period, they are ex being excavated. Like, uh, people would dig them uh, in search of gold or other things and they were finding these coins inside. So one person, uh, Charles Lassen, uh, he finds this Indo-Bacterian cancer. Uh, it's, it's a bilingual coin. It's got the name of the king uh, 
Agathocles. Agathocles, written in Greek, and on the opposite, on the reverse side, you got Raja Agathocula, written in Brahmi. Okay, this bilingual inscription helps him crack few more consonants. It's just mapping them, just like the Rosetta Stone, just like the Behistun inscription to crack cuneiform script. This coin helps him crack few more consonants. And then Princep, when he actually sends, write this in a letter to Princep, and Princep publishes that letter in the journal. And at the bottom, Princep writes his comments. So in journal, lots of people are subscribing, and then there will be critics to this journal. They are saying, why are you guys uh, publishing all these coins and all? What use is of? Uh, what is the use of all of this? So he sends those who would deprecate the study of old coins as a useless and uninteresting waste of time and ingenuity. And there are such we fear even among the readers of this journal, journal frequently mistake the means for the end and supposed to be enamored with the very defects of the barbarous specimens of ancient art we see out with such ardor rather than give us credit for being impelled by the desire to look through them at the history of the times they faintly but certainly portray. Right? Twice have a small band of collectors been enabled to oppose a triumphant reply to such skeptics even with the uncompromising material of purely, purely Indian relics, without counting the splendid but more natural harvest in ancient battery. So through these very same coins, they were able to uh, decipher the names of lots of kings of the Gupta period. Uh, in fact, later, James Princep being a person working in the mint himself, he gets lots of coins. Uh, he gets lots of coins from the period of the Kshatrapas, ruling during the 3rd and 4th century. So, Princep joins this bandwagon, compares his bilingual coins, cracks few more consonants. Okay? Clue 5 and the final nail in the coffin is from Sanchi. So, he's by then deciphered lots of consonants. Sanchi is an interesting place in Madhya Pradesh, a little away from Bhopal. Must visit place. This place was abandoned, it's on a hillock. It's got a very old stupa erected from the time of Ashoka later lots of people add to it, the Shungas add to it, Guptas built a temple there, Harshavardana builds a temple over there. Uh, stupa is basically where Buddha's relics are kept, but there are later periods stupas are formed even as a dedicate as a as things that are just for uh, for the purpose of prayer. Um, later some of the teachers of uh, Buddhism, even their relics were put in stupas. So this two, around the stupa there are uh, there would be this uh, uh, what, what do you call that Rain. railings the, the railings so on Sanchez stupa these railings on on top of railings there are inscriptions in Brahmi so these are donative inscriptions which is like I am giving so and so money to for the construction of this so a copy of these inscriptions are made and sent to Asiatic society. So Prince looks at this, as you see, as you might faintly see, lots of these words, this, these two characters that are there almost at the end of every sentence. Very same character. Okay. So then he writes this famous paragraph. People who uh, generally people when you ask how was Brahmi deciphered, they like they looked at Sanchi inscriptions and deciphered it. That's not true, but what they quote is this passage all the time. Princip writes, I was stuck at all their terminating with the same two letters, some, some characters. Coupling this circumstance with their extreme brevity and insulated position, which proved that they could not be fragments of a continuous text. They must be some words of their own or standing on their own. It immediately occurred that they must either record, that they must record either the obituary notices or more probably the offerings or presents of votaries, as is known to be present custom in the Buddhist temples of Avaha, where numerous dvajas or flagstaffs, images and small chaityas are crowded with this enclosure, surrounding the chief kapola, each bearing the name of the donor. He says it's a common practice elsewhere to write the name of the donor on this. The next point noted was, the frequent occurrence of this letter this is actually sa already set down incontestably as sa so among the consonants that were deciphered was a sa 
Now this, uh, now this uh, had learned from the Saurashtra coins deciphered only a day or two before to be a sign of the genetic case singular being the Sa of Pali, uh, Pali or the Sya of the Sanskrit which is like uh, Maharishasya Dhanam like, which is donation by Maharish. Sya is the, what do you call that? It, it's, it's a referencing a sound, okay? Of so and so of the gift, okay? Must then be the form of each brief sentence and the whole A as Anuswara, which is like the dot, led to the speedy recognition of the word Dhanam. This they know is A. Then you put a hyphen, it's A. So there is some word A and there is some character hmm, Dhanam. It's just a guess, but it's a fantastic guess. Okay? So he said, it quickly answered, led to a speedy recognition of the word Dhanam, teaching me the very two letters, Da and Na, most different from known forms. There are some consonants known, Da and Na were not known. And which foiled me most in my former attempts. He was not able to find that. Since 1834 also, my acquaintance with ancient alphabets had become so familiar that most of the remaining letters in the